Good morning, everyone. Thank you all, or good afternoon, actually. I'm sorry about this. Uh, my name is Paula Arias. I'm here a professor at the University of Miami. I want to thank everyone for coming today. The idea is to have an interesting conversation today about the interplay between wrongful convictions and the freedom of expression, especially in the context of Ecuador. I want to thank the panelists for being willing to talk to you about this important topic, which sometimes passed like something unseen by all of us because we don't connect that some of the times the freedom of expression is repressed, is sanctioned, and the system is used for that to happen, and it becomes a matter of a wrongful conviction. And that's why, thanks to some of the people here and the organization that put forward the project that we are discussing today, we are whole, we're very, very uh, much in this conversation, and to that being the first conversation of the topic, because there is a lot of to say about. In light of this, I want to thank first the Inter-American Institute for Democracy, who pushed forward this project together with uh, Mr. Kimball. He's, he's an Ecuadorian citizen, and his passion is about Ecuador human rights and all the circumstances that are happening in his own country. At the same time, I want to take prof thanks Professor uh, Craig Troshino, who is here today. He's a member of our faculty. He's, he was a public defender for so many years, uh, dealing especially with very delicate ca cases. He's in charge nowadays of the wrongful convictions clinic at the University of Miami. And thank you so much for being here today. He's a great and recognized scholar. Besides him is Professor Caroline Carbin. As you probably know, she's a member also of our faculty. Her area of expertise is in particularly in the freedom of expression area, First Amendment rights. She is well recognized and well known for all her academic work in that area. It's a member of the faculty, and thank you also, Caroline, for being here today. At the same time, and I'm gonna do my best to pronounce the name, we have Arp Boyne, Born quite well. I'm a challenged person with names, but I did my best. Uh, he's a member, he's a fellow at the University of Washington College of Law Center of International Commercial Arbitration. He's also a human rights advocate in the sense that his passion and his dedication is in matters of human rights issue. He's been in front of the inter-American human rights system and also is one of the persons involved in the project that we're discussing today, and I'm really, really thankful for you being here. And on his side, I have Stephen, and I forgot his last name. I'm very, very sorry about it. And he is part of the Inter-American Bar Association. He's representing the organization who is also supporting this project and is willing to start this conversation, not only in Ecuador, but in the rest of the region. So thank you very much for being here and for sharing with us all of your knowledge. With no further ado, the last person to introduce is James Kimmel. He will talk a little bit about how this project originated, how it actually started, what is the reason behind it, and what is to come afterwards. Thank you all, and the show must begin. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming here. Thank you for Professor Arias and the International Mood Court of the University, University of Miami School of Law for this invitation and organizing this great panel. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here along with such prestigious scholars such as uh, Professor Corbin, Professor Procino, and Professor Bjorn Arp. Uh, I would like also especially acknowledge uh, Stephen Harper, the treasurer of the International Bar Association, for coming and being here with us. Um, Together with the Inter-American Institute for Democracy, Inter-American Bar Association, we had organized independent case studies of court decisions who contact and ruling violate human rights. The result of this project is the publication of the book, The Role of the Judiciary in Human Rights Violations in Ecuador, Six Case Studies, which was presented first in Capitol Hill last, December, last September. And similar studies are under course about the uh, about the role of the judiciary in Venezuela and Bolivia. This work is not a political analysis, but rather an academic studies that reviews with judicial precision opinions 
in light of fundamental rights. Repeated complaints from citizens and the press of the judicialization of repression and criminalization of politics have given rise to a serious crisis in judicial independence in Ecuador. Therefore, the study placed in the field of scientific evidence, what until now have been the denunciation of the victims, the press, political debate, and reports, and, as well as reports by the Department of State and independent organizations. Now I'm going to present the cases. These cases were selected by, mo by some of the most prestigious scholars in Ecuador in matters of constitutional, criminal, and related matters. Accordingly, I do not pretend to summarize the cases, just to highlight some of the violations in order to illustrate the situation. The first case of study is to prison for forwarding pamphlets, that's how I denominate it, is the case of the Ten of Luluncoto by Professor Jaime Vintimilla Saldana. In this case, the government got the support of the courts to allow the detention and punishment of 10 young people who were planning to participate in an indigenous march on the grounds that they were planning terrorist attacks. Something absurd in the circumstances of the case which was to participate in a public and peaceful march for water, life, and dignity. Professor Vintimilla, the author, has recorded a brief audio presentation about this case that I would like to play now. Good afternoon. I would like to talk about the terrorism force in a constitutional state of law, the case of Tenem Blue Court. First of all, I have to thank IID for the great possibility to speak about the judicial witness that is destroying the rule of law in Ecuador. Or maybe, if we think better, is reframing. I have some caveats about the reality of our justice. But the core one is the new concept of coup d'etat that is being perpetrated by the intervention of lawyers that are defending the interests of the public servants, the president, or any public servant instead of their rule of law. The purpose of the case, a study titled The Ten of Blue Koto, is to describe the serious human rights violations carry out over the course of proceeding before various courts, focusing on the abuse of various protected measures, as well as the transgression of the criminal law principle of consistency through the distorted interpretation and application of the Jura Novit Curia principle, all of which led us down to the dark path of legal theory of the criminal law of the enemy. We have just to explain what are the facts. It's unbelievable. Ten young people were punished just for one sin, for one crime. To be gathered on March the 3rd, trying to talk about the Constitution and about their participation in a march that is going to be trying to be defended the war. It's terrible because never is possible to find evidence and the evidence that they have is just incredible. The police just find mobile phones, USB devices, cosmetic mirrors, pennies, 20 bucks bills, a bus ticket, a notebook with the phrase building a corruption free Ecuador, and all the personal effects, but nothing that has to do with a potential terrorist offense as the police decide to blame these people. The terrible thing is also that the judicial system just violated at least 20 or 25 human rights and constitutional rights. The case I think is memorable just to prove that in Ecuador the judicial system is not trying to protect people but trying to defend the president of the public servants. Maybe we're changing 
the order. The citizens right now, they don't have rights, but the gover government, the public servants, they have the rights. I think it's very important to defend the state of law. Otherwise, the authoritarianism will be the rule of every day. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next we have, the next case we have is a prison for a tweet. The case of Sebastián Ceballos by Daniela Salazar. Hello. Oops. <laughs> Here, a criminal conviction was issued for having sent a tweet in which Ceballos insinuated that a high public official had obtained his position thanks to his family connections. To criminal prosecute someone for sending a tweet that implies something about a public official is disproportionate and threatening to freedom of expression. The third case is convicted for applauding. The case of Francisco Endara Daza by Carlos Manos Alvas. In a surprising sentence, Francisco Endara Daza was sentenced to eight months in prison for the crime of paralyzing public services. In the absence, in the absence of evidence of his direct participation in the acts damaging the property of Ecuador TV, when after a police strike against the government, Mr. Endara was convicted for applauding the demonstrators. The fourth case is the 29 of Saraguro by Rafael Paredes. Another case of paralyzing public services in which two indigenous people were sentenced to four years in prison for organizing a demonstration and blocking the Pan American Highway. The disproportion of the, tense, the sentence speaks for itself. Mr. Paredes also has presented, uh, prepared a video about this case. Everyone, thank you for having me today. Um, I will be presenting the case of uh, Saraguro 29. Um, this is uh, the case that I have analyzed in the article in the book. Um, the relationship between Ecuador's government and the country's civil society has been highly confrontational. By implementing strict regulation of organizations, the government endeavored to control their activities. The government has also used the police and military to dissuade public demonstrations by opposition groups. This confrontation has progressed in the criminal justice system where proceedings have been initiated against members of these groups who have publicly protested against the government. Criminal prosecution of protesters and social leaders has been used as a means of intimidation, seeking to deter future protests. Proceedings have become a form of punishment, a sanction on their own, even before a ruling has been issued. The defendants are considered criminals through this form of persecution. Preventive detention and other similar measures are commonly requested by the Attorney General's Office, their prosecution. In this context, there has been a particularly contentious relationship between the government and the indigenous movement. Several indigenous communities have made public demonstrations, as in the case that is discussed in this article. In August 2015, members of an indigenous community in Saraguro, the province of Loja, participated in a public demonstration. According to several accounts, 31 members of this community were violently arrested with an excessive use of force by a disproportionate number of police and military agents. They used tear gas and batons against those presents, disregarding if they were protesters or bystanders. The prosecution charged them for obstructing a public service, a crime sanctioned with one to three years of incarceration. Prior to the trial, the government, through the Ministry of Interior and the National Police Judicial Advisory Office, presented a complaint against the detained and followed a private prosecution of, in the case. As private accusers, the Ministry of Police received notification of all procedural documents. In this way, the government kept informed on the developments of the case and actively participated in the process. In the trial's proceeding, there was an unhealthy interest from the government in seeking an exemplary sanction. There is a clear intent on part of the government to impede protests, especially on part of indigenous communities, by using criminal laws as deterrent. In the case of Saraguro, the protesters were exercising their constitutional and international rights of assembly, 
to resistance and to demonstrate in public. Even though in some instances the accused are not sentenced, they have already endured the public humiliation of having been detained, temporarily imprisoned, and stood in trial for a crime that most times they have not committed. The government has abused the judicial system in criminal law, and prosecutors, judges, and courts have given in, subduing constitutional rights instead of applying them progressively and actively. The judicial system is no longer impartial, it lacks credibility, it is unreliable, and it doesn't follow due process of, or guarantee constitutional rights. An indispensable element of the constitutional state is the separation of powers, legal security, and respect for the authority of the judicial system. Ecuador should abandon the use of malicious criminal proceedings as a means of intimidation for political purposes and embrace the principles of a modern democracy. Thank you all. This way, I come to the fifth case, which is the seizure of the television media outlets, TSC Television and Gamavision. It was by Professor Jorge Zavala Egas. The taking was justified on the basis of criminal basis brought against defective owners, Roberto and William Isaias. The study illustrates how the government publicly expressed its criticism for the criminal acquittal of the media owners. But the, pro the prosecutor general and the Supreme Court found no basis to prosecute the Isaias brother. In response, the president, as well as various legislators of his party, publicly declared the disagreement and demanded the dismissal and sanction of the judges. The new judges, more amenable to the government, condemned the owners to eight years in prison. This case, for this case, Professor Zavala has prepared a video that we're going to present right now. Thank you. In the book that Jorge Zavala Egas and Jorge Zavala Luque wrote, we describe the seizure of three television media outlets owned by Roberto and William Isaias de Sun, that was justified to an undue process in which their constitutional and fundamental rights were violated and their property taken. This was a political mission whose goal was to increase Ecuador's national government control over private media outlets. These unlawful actions sought to be justified through a criminal prosecution in which the executive branch of government, which manages and dominates the judicial power, ordered them to forge a condemnatory sentence for peculation, so that Roberto and William Isaias Lassun could not claim the right over their television media and property. However, the case went all the way up to the Human Rights Committee of the United Nations that condemned the seizure of the television properties as a violation of due process and ordered the Ecuador government to repair the damage and return the television media outlets to the Isaias family. This sad Ecuadorian story is narrated in this book. For those who are interested, uh, Professor Zavala has provided with, us, with a free copy of his recent work on the resolution of the Human Rights Committee that will be available at the end of the, of the panel. This, the, the sixth case is, has the same interference of the seizure of the Isaias brother occurring in the case of the 12 students of Central Technical High School, which was by Professor Pier Pigossi. Although at the outset, bo both the prosecution and the competent judge did not see any crime in organizing a public protest against the change of the name of their school, the president personally ordered the judge to revoke this sanction and the student to be criminal punished. Two days later, the prosecution resumed the trial and the judges condemned the students for the crime of rebellion. These cases speak for themselves about the situation of freedom of expression and wrongful convictions in Ecuador. This last a decade in Ecuador, there has been a record for the deterioration of fundamental elements of rule of law, due process, democracy, and human rights. With this, uh, thank you all. I, I open the discussion for the, for the panel. Thank you. So, to start the conversation, I would like to ask to the panel about, and especially to Professor Trochino, 
if the spider was a mistake or not on the procedure. Can any of these co cases demonstrate that is a, there is a violation of the divergence on the due process guarantees? Yeah, I, I would say absolutely that there are. Um, when you get into the issue of wrongful convictions, first you want to identify what do you mean by wrongful conviction, and you can have a couple of different scenarios. One, you can have a person who is fundamentally, actually innocent, um, in which, believe it or not, that happens on a regular basis, and it happens on a regular basis in the United States. Since 1989, there have been 2,000 exonerations in the United States. That amounts to about six per month for 28 years running. There's been 349 DNA exonerations in ca cases where the person who was convicted was proven scientifically 100% not to have done the crime. Um, that's one angle. The other part of wrongful convictions is where due process and procedural safeguards break down. Um, that happens in situations, uh, at least from the United States perspective, where due process is violated. The Fourth Amendment, uh, for instance, could be violated on uh, protections against unlawful searches and seizures. And the Sixth Amendment could be violated with regard to effective assistance of counsel. One way a regime or uh, a government in power can seek to um, squelch dissent is to buy encouraging situations and scenarios where those procedural safeguards are allowed to break down. One of the crises we have in the United States is an indigent defense. Uh, and over the past 20 or so years, indigent defense has been uh, consistently defunded and underfunded to circumstances where, uh, say, a system public defender has uh, three, four, five, six hundred cases at a time. Uh, that's an untenable situation, and it doesn't seem, uh, by any stretch of the imagination, the Sixth Amendment guarantee to right to effective assistance of counsel could be could be uh, uh, ensured. Um, this is a well known. Uh, Allowing procedural safeguards, uh, uh, official misconduct, police misconduct, prosecutorial misconduct to continue is a well-known uh, tactic, if you will, uh, of certain uh, entities that want to stifle dissent and criminalize uh, expression. In uh, 1940, the United States Supreme Court, in the case Chambers versus Florida, addressed issues of police uh, overreaching uh, and said, quote, the testimonies of centuries in governments of varying kinds over populations of different races and beliefs stood as proof that the physical and mental torture, coercion, had brought about the tragically unjust sacrifices of some who were the noblest and most useful of their generations. The rack, the thumbscrew, the wheel, solitary confinement, protracted questioning and cross-questioning, and other ingenious forms of entrapment of the helpless and unpopular had left their wake of mutilated bodies and shattered minds along the way to the cross, the guillotine, the stake, and the hangman's noose. And they who have suffered most from the secret dictatorial proceedings have almost always been the poor, the ignorant, the numerically weak, the friendless, and the powerless. So there's a long human history and a long recognition in the United States that forcing criminal sanctions onto somebody to squelch dissent, to squelch political speech, uh, to squelch opposition uh, exists. And so from the context of beyond an actual innocence point of view, I believe that all of these cases presented would qualify, in my opinion, as, quote, wrongful convictions. And taking that idea of squashing dissent, right, and conjoined with the freedom of expression, Professor Carvey, what do you have to say about the case on the television and gamma vision case? Well, actually, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about just the role of press and protest in a democracy. Um, so generally, when we talk about the free speech clause in the United States, there are thought to be three sort of theories underlying our constitutional protection of speech. One is we protect speech to allow a marketplace of ideas that helps us with our search for truth and knowledge. Another is we protect speech to sort of promote our self-expression and autonomy. 
But one of the main reasons we protect speech is to ensure our system of government, to ensure that we have a democracy. We can't have a democracy, in other words, without free speech. So part of what makes us a democracy is that we have the right to choose our elected officials and vote them out of office when they displease us, when they advocate policies that we disagree with, or whether they act in sort of immoral or illegal ways. So then the question is, well, how do we know if we approve or disapprove of any particular policy? And the reason we know is because there is a free flow of information in this country, right? So how do we know if we approve or disapprove of the Affordable Care Act or its replacement? Well, we can do research about it and we can find out about it and we can find out about it because we protect free speech. And how do we know what our particular officials are doing vis-a-vis -vis healthcare? How do we know what policies they voted on and advocated for? The press, right? It's the press that keeps us informed about what our elected officials do. And of course, how do we know if our government officials are acting improperly or illegally? Again, it's the press. Right? The press serves as an essential check on abuse of power. And so when President Nixon, for example, when his reelection campaign broke into the Democratic National Headquarters and tried to steal information and wiretap the phones, we found out about it thanks to the press. Right? So we can't have, we can't have a democratic system of government without a free flow of information and without the press. Um, but free speech is not just a means to democracy, it's also a defining characteristic of democracy. Right? Part of what makes us a democracy is not just the fact that we vote for our elected officials, but also that we have the right to speak about them, to criticize them, and to protest. Um, in fact, the Supreme Court in this country has recognized that there are certain places, certain public places, just as the streets and parks, that are protected areas of protest. And any attempt to regulate what people might say in those areas are presumptively unconstitutional. In other words, you can't pass a law that says no Muslim ban protests in the park. That is just unconstitutional given our protection of free speech. And you can see from our history, from the civil rights movement to the Vietnam War era protests, Right? They reveal the importance of these kinds of peaceful civil protests that allow people to voice their opinions on the issues of the day. And finally, while we can't have a democracy without a free press, we also can't have a free press without a functioning democracy. And I think that's what the cases make very clear. Right? If we do not have a court that is willing to strike down laws that violate people's individual rights, then those individual rights are lost. And so you can see how these things are sort of mutually reinforcing. And um, I think I can stop there. I, I, the one last thing if anyone asks, wants to ask me about is one would think that what happened in Ecuador could never happen here. <laughs> Um, but there are some things that are happening here that are also raising similar concerns. But I'll, I won't say, speak to that unless asked. Thank you very much. And talking you about know, no, that I don't know if it's politically correct no, or not. Oh, I don't care if it's politically correct. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure I don't take I'll up join too much on that. time. <laughs> but talking about that idea of squashing freedom of expression or freedom of um, speech through a democratic process. I would like to ask Professor Bjorn Karp <laughs> from an international law point of view, right? What are the challenges that these cases are presenting within the framework that your colleagues today have presented? <coughs> yeah, thank you so much. <coughs> well, I uh, <laughs> I would certainly uh, see many challenges because the, the problems that these six cases raise 
Sh shall I try to use the microphone? Is it really working? Because, hello? Hello? Does it make a difference? It's in the camera. Ah, okay. <laughs> Excuse me, I didn't know that. Uh, so, certainly the, the challenges that, that these six cases pose that are mm, contained in the book that we are presenting today are very diverse and uh, they are they affect many different aspects of the realization of international human rights. Uh, some of the cases here refer to freedom of expression, uh, to freedom of speech, to political participation, to the right of, of freedom of association. And I think that they also affect another aspect, which has to do with the what, what we in academia call the positive and the negative dimension of these rights. Because uh, when we talk about fundamental or human rights, we have to ask ourselves if the specific right only means that the state has to allow people to exercise freely those rights, or does it also include the obligation by the state to exercise some positive act, some, some actual conduct, to allow that people generally can freely exercise these rights. So it's the, it's the positive dimension of this. When the human rights violations are particularly serious, particularly grave, particularly mm, clearly visible, most of the times we are claiming the negative aspect of the exercise of fundamental freedoms, where we simply ask the country to really stay out of the freedom of exercise by people. And we are happy, we would be grateful, and, and it would be a successful situation if, uh, uh, if, if the state would not interfere with this freedom of exercise of, of those rights. However, sometimes, uh, uh, when the situation becomes a little bit more complex, uh, we also would want a positive action by the state to intervene in a corrective way so that everybody, even the, s the smaller minorities in a society, can have access to their respective freedoms. And I think this is a big difference between many Latin American countries and the United States in particular. In the United States, many freedoms are guaranteed and often it is, it is actually true that the government has uh, many, uh, uh, there are many safeguards to prevent us from government interference into our private sphere. However, uh, many human rights still are being violated in the United States because there is a lack of positive action, a lack of positive correcting intervention by the state that would allow that even minorities could express themselves freely and without harassment from other private parties or private companies eventually to, do, to exercise their freedom of expression, uh, freedom of association, and so on. I think there are many examples that we could pose. Those six cases that we are looking here in this book, they essentially claim, or, or the underlying message in these, ex in these cases, is to, to at least have the freedom from the government to at least be able to send out a tweet and, and, and not be put into jail as a consequence out of that. And, um, and there we, we see in this context that, that in these very, very uh, fundamental, very basic violations, uh, people in countries like Ecuador, the only real recourse that they have is to try to submit their cases to international human rights mechanisms, to try to, to submit their cases to institutions like the Inter-American Human Rights Commission, to the uh, human rights bodies of the United Nations, to try to obtain a, a, a minimum of redress uh, or recognition to, to, to have restituted their basic dignity. Uh, because obviously it stigmatizes these individuals that are being put in jail because of the exercise of freedom of expression to, to at least, as I said, to, to be regaining their, their basic dignity. And this applies to freedom of expression, but also to many other human rights that are being viol violated in, in those countries. And, uh, and I think uh, uh, this is one of the big uh, uh, challenges the international system has right now to really recognize the, uh, these, these situations and, and to, to try to move the governments at least so that there can be generated a critical mass within the civil society that could take on their rights and exercise them with a minimum of freedom. 
And this is a long fight. I, I, I don't have the solution for this because uh, it's, uh, it doesn't depend on me or any, anything like that. It's, a, it's really a critical assessment that all of us as human rights defenders and human rights activists and human rights academics have to do to, to try to see how we can help those institutions to, to effectively uh, do these functions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I do have a question for Professor Harvey. In light of the use of social media, right? I know the, inter the US Supreme Court has ruled about the use of social media as a way of expressing. Uh, but if we have a case in this book about just tweeting. How we can encompass that idea of freedom of expression through social media that is something very new and how it has been approached? Um, so freedom of speech is not limited to certain media. It's so if you were speaking, it doesn't matter how you were speaking. You could be writing a pamphlet, you could be filming a movie, you can be tweeting. As long as you are communicating, it is protected by the free speech clause. And to Professor uh, Trochino, I do have a question. And uh, in the case of Francisco Andara, one of the cases here, there seems to be a disproportion between what the conduct was and the punishment that was imposed. It, does it raise an issue of the wrongful conviction per se or not? Dis when you address the issue of proportionality, normally you're talking about sentencing and sentencing structure, which doesn't necessarily impact whether the conviction is correct or wrongful. However, um, there are circumstances where disproportionate sentencings can be used in order to target a particular population for uh, silence and disenfranchisement. For instance, um, the, it's now been documented and reported that in the early 70s the Nixon administration put full force into the quote war on drugs in order to target anti-war activists and African Americans uh, protesting for civil rights. Fast forward to the 1980s when the crack epidemic came up, they changed the federal sentencing guidelines to a 100 to 1 sentencing disparity between crack versus powder cocaine. Therefore, if you had one gram of crack cocaine and one gram of powder cocaine, the person who got the crack cocaine got sentenced 100 times more severely than the person with the powder cocaine. Why? Well, if you consider for a moment who uses crack cocaine and who uses powder cocaine, you can get into the socioeconomics of why that happened. Recently that's been changed. It's only 18 to 1 now. So we still have that embedded into our sentencing guidelines and our sentencing culture. In addition to that, what disproportionate sentencing laws do is they force people to enter plea negotiations and enter guilty pleas even though they're actually innocent. About 10% um, of all the DNA exonerations, the 349 DNA, ex DNA exonerations, these are people who are scientifically actually 100% positively innocent, pled guilty to crimes like rape and murder. Because if you think, why would somebody do that? Why would somebody plead guilty to a crime they didn't commit? Well, when the prosecution is saying, you go to trial, you get convicted, you're going to the electric chair, or you're going to be sentenced to death, pleading to 30 years is not a bad idea under a lot of circumstances. Uh, in the mid-1980s, the average case, average criminal, criminal case that was resolved by a trial was about 18%. In 2005, it was 3%, and that holds true today. So 97% of all criminal cases in the United States are resolved by a plea. Why? Sentencing disparities primarily. If you go to trial and you get found guilty, you will get, you will get sentenced much more severely than you do if you enter a plea. So these sentencing disparities, although they don't immediately impact whether the conviction is correct or incorrect, what they do is dilute the constitutional right to a trial when the constitutional right to a trial is diluted, the truth functioning of a trial, the great disinfectant that is cross-examination, gets diluted, and we end up with six exonerations every month for a period of 28 years. 
So although it might not be implicating people who are actually factually innocent, it uh, creates a, an environment in which uh, that becomes more and more likely. That's very interesting. And thinking about how to the system is used to suppress expression, I do have a question from Professor Harvin about it. Is despite that the system is or is not designed to suppress it, when it is actually put forward for that to happen, what is actually the consequence in long term, not to that immediate circumstance, like in this case, to the long term expression in a democracy? Um, I think what you're getting at is um, the concept of chill, right? The idea that chilling speech. So if you, there are uh, very often, um, this is one of the reasons why laws are struck down under free speech clause for being vague and confusing, is because if people don't know whether they're violating the law or not, even if what they were doing might be perfectly legal, they may opt not to speak because they're unsure whether it's legal or not, and so their speech has effectively been chilled. And so that's a, a, a less, uh, a sort of a more prosaic way of chilling speech. But obviously, if you see people regularly punished for their speech, or if the punishment is disproportionate, then you might think twice about um, speaking out. And, well, I'm going to open to the public to see if anybody has any questions for the panelists. I do have <coughs> quest one question for Professor Bjorn about the idea, one of the cases is about this um, gentleman that was in a meeting, a public meeting, and stood up and was applauded. Does the extent of his expression, does the extent of his conduct. And he was prosecuted for that conduct. What do you think, in light of the democracy of Ecuador, the freedom of expression within the Constitution and within the American system is going to happen long term? <clears throat> yeah, well, it's, um, uh, first of all, obviously that is a very sad case, and it demonstrates again that, the, that, that in Ecuador uh, the criminal laws are used to, uh, uh, to, 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 to quash, the, to, to silence uh, any form or, or certain forms of expression in this context, particularly expression that is somehow connected to a political context or in a political context or in a context that at least from the point of view of the government actually is political because some of this expression in, in many other countries would not even be considered political speech, but it has some connotations. So, so it was uh, considered provocative to the government and they used the criminal laws uh, to, 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 to quash that that expression. Now, international human rights law has a number of rules on the freedom of expression. And uh, in international, uh, in, this inter in this context of international human rights law, freedom of expression is not an absolute right. So uh, I also should notify that. Uh, no international law or, or rule, be it the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, or the American Convention on Human Rights, uh, says that freedom of expression is absolute and that we can uh, transmit any message, applaud anything that we simply want because we, we, we have this freedom of expression. So there are certain limits. And these, these limits have to see are, are connected. I don't have now the exact text of, of Article 11 of the American Convention of Human Rights with me, but uh, these limits have to do with the fact that the, that the message can be limited by the government when it attends against public morals, uh, national security, um, uh, 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 you know, criteria that have um, uh, an impact on the society or a very strong impact on the basic uh, safety and security of the society as a whole. 
and uh, the limitations, the measures of limitation that the government eventually would adopt to, to, to regulate this exercise of expression have to be measures that have, and now I'm citing um, uh, the European Convention of Human Rights, they have to be in accordance with measures that are sustainable in a democratic society. So even though the state eventually can adopt re rules that, that regulate expression, they have to be still, you know, and even if it may be justified, even for public morals to limit this exercise of freedom of expression, even these measures of limitation have to be acceptable within a democratic society. Though, so there is this democratic salvation clause that, that preserves uh, a freedom of expression within a political context because within a political context it's uh, 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 even somehow initiative, initially provocative messages uh, can still be acceptable and, and need to be and need to be conveyed. So um, uh, so all this wants to wants to mean well all all, all this means that um, uh, 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 there needs there needs to be found a balance. Inter uh, and international human rights bodies have made a, a very uh, long uh, chain of, of case law, have applied um, uh, a lot of uh, jurisprudence, jurisprudence already to interpret what does it mean to limit you know, uh, freedom of expression within a democratic society based on, on public interest or public morals and, and state security or state safety. Uh, and the limit that international human rights bodies have drawn are very broad limits. So if there is a situation of doubt between limiting and not limiting, the, the, in situations of doubt, the, the, the limits have always been uh, put burdening the government and broadening the freedom of speech. So within these very broad contours of normative contours that exist within uh, international human rights law, I think that it is very easy to arrive to the conclusion that to applause, to applaud uh, a manifestation, I don't recall exactly what it was, but I think it was a political meeting, some, some association that was being uh, constituted, which was not an association that was advocating the use of violence, because that could be actually an element that could trigger, even in inter under international law, the application of these limitation clauses, but it was not in this particular case. So to applaud such a meeting would certainly pass the scrutiny of any decent international human rights body. There's no question about that. And that is what this case makes so clear. And particularly if you read this case, and I really invite you to read it, uh, the banality, it's, it was really a banality of this, this applause, uh, it makes it obvious that, that it that the, that the real reason why they used the criminal laws to prosecute that individual were exclusively based on the expression of a political opinion which was not in favor of the government. And like this we have so many other situations in so many other countries. Uh, and, and, and again, this is where international human rights bodies should be holding a very strong stage and, 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 and express their disagreement with these policies of the government and declare the international responsibility of those countries. So in, in the United States, it is also true that there is no constitutional right that is absolute. Uh, and that's true for speech as for anything else. And in American law, there is a very big distinction between laws that regulate speech that are content neutral and laws that regulate speech that are targeting the speech. So if the government is trying to regulate speech, for example, uh, an example of a content neutral regulation is you can't, in a, in a public park, you can't use loudspeakers louder than a certain volume, right? That's regulating your speech, but it's not regulating because of what you're saying. It's regulating it for some other reason. 
Um, and so if there were a law saying you can't make any sound someplace, uh, you know, if the plowed, if for some reason the applause was uh, magnified to an incredible decibel level and violated some neutral <laughs> law, some law that regulated speech neutrally, it would be fine. Uh, those tend to be, they're still scrutinized, they're st we're still a little suspicious of them, but we're not nearly as suspicious as when the government regulates speech because of its content. And laws that regulate speech because of its content, with a few categor category exceptions, those are presumptively unconstitutional. And that's because here in the United States, we don't trust our government. We do not trust, I mean, this is sort of one of the backbone of our free speech jurisprudence, is we do not trust the government to decide what people can say and what they can't say. And we certainly don't just let them, you know, we certainly don't trust them to decide what we're allowed to see or not see or hear or not hear. Because if there's one thing we can reliably count on is that people in power will want to keep their power. And one of the ways they can do that is by suppressing criticism of them. So any attempt to regulate speech because of its content really is just unconstitutional. And so clapping your hands because you approve of, someone, of what someone is saying is, first of all, speech. Um, and it is targeting speech because of its content. And that is just out and out unconstitutional, or it would be here. May I answer to that? Yeah. OK, yeah. 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 Um, uh, I, uh, I appreciate these, these comments, but I think uh, this, the comparison be between what I explained about international human rights law, freedom of speech regulation in international human rights, and what my uh, esteemed colleague just explained about the United States, demonstrates th that, that in fact there are different ways to actually regulate the same thing. And the United States uh, practice, which, which goes back many, many years, even before international human rights treaties have been adopted, is, 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 is really very different in these issues on, internet, on, on, on you know, civil rights regulation. Uh, how, however, I think that precisely the existence of this very broad practice of international human rights protection is a great opportunity also for the United States and, and for the United States civil rights uh, you know, movement to, to evaluate and to see what are the strengths and, and, and the weaknesses of the fundamental rights protection through the judiciary in, in the United States. Because uh, I, I would argue, and this is uh, hypothetical that I'm bringing into this, into this room, I would argue that precisely this distinction between the, um, uh, the content of the speech, the protection of the content of the speech, and the, the instruments or the, 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 you know, the, the means of the speech that is being done in the United States is a very tricky, uh, it's a very risky uh, distinction that has served well the Supreme Court in so many cases, and, and it, it seems to work uh, but uh, if, if we look uh, to what I said actually at the beginning of my, of my intervention here uh, this, this morning, that there's also the positive dimension of regulation of free speech, uh, it can actually run into, into certain areas, gray areas, where it will be very difficult to the tribunals to systematically apply this, this jurisprudence. And maybe, and again, maybe, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say anything absolute, but maybe the international human rights practice can be uh, a very interesting element of, of revision or of, or of looking back over the, the practice of the Supreme Court in, in the regulation and, and, and holdings on these matters uh, to try to, to even go deeper into the analysis and protection of these rights. And I'm saying that, and with this I close, that, that we really have to do this urgently because maybe in the next few years we will have a good number of civil rights cases before the Supreme Court again. And, um, and uh, we don't know how the, how the courts are going to react to that. Thank you. Yeah, if, if I may, it, uh, along with uh, addressing it 
urgently and diligently. There's also the concept of not taking any rights for granted. Um, currently, there are 18 bills in state legislatures attempting to criminalize dissent or protest to some degree. For instance, Arizona uh, SB 1142 applies RICO laws to protests that may turn violent. If you're not familiar with what RICO laws are, that's the Racketeering Influence and Corrupt Organizations Act that was originally designed to go after mafiosos, right, and conspiracies. So, as this bill sits in Arizona, if I'm sitting here saying, you know what, this is a great discussion, there's going to be a protest on the bricks at 2.30. Let's all go. We go down to the protest at 2.30, and then somebody throws a brick through a window. According to this law in Arizona, they can arrest us all, and under the beauty of RICO violations, seize our assets. Right? Assets. So now we're not criminalizing or saying you can't say anything. We're just going to say we're going to take your car if you do. On top of that, and this dovetails into the, uh, the, uh, the 29 Saraguro case uh, where they essentially blocked the road. Well, that immediately brought to mind, in my mind, the uh, Standing Rock uh, Dakota Access Pipeline protests in North Dakota. North Dakota House Bill 1203 exempts liability for a driver who hits a, a protester in the street. They proposed that in Florida, too. Yes. So you don't have to go there. It's right, right here. And, and in Minnesota, and in Minnesota <laughs> as well, because there was a lot of Black Lives Matters protests in Minnesota that shut down highways. Right? So now, it's not, a, it's not a statute that's saying you can't say X, Y, and Z, or you'll go to jail if you say X, Y, and Z. But if you're walking across the street, and you're engaging in civil disobedience, which was the primary tool that won a lot of civil rights protections in the 1960s. I mean, Dr. King organized the march from Selma to Montgomery, basically shutting down the roads, right? Now, I can drive my car and run you over, and I'm no longer liable for it. So now we're directing, we're directing laws at curtailing speech and dissent that are not directed at the speech, but they're directed at your checking account and your health insurance and your body, right? So to the extent we say, well, that could never happen in the United States, which Professor Corbin was saying earlier, that when was, I first- that was on, Those were on my list. Oh, those, okay. <laughs> well, great minds think alike. I was reading these cases and my first act was, well, this couldn't happen in the United, oh yeah, wait a minute, it did. You know, for instance, uh, in the 1990s, a nun protesting at Fort Benning because they moved the School of Americas from Panama to Fort Benning where they trained uh, Latin American and Central American soldiers to go commit atrocities back in their own country. Nuns went there, this one particular nun broke through the fence in protest at Fort Benning, she served six months in federal prison for that, for trespassing on federal lands. So we have a fairly robust history of, of doing this. Now granted, she knew she was gonna get arrested and she got arrested to make the political point, but the arrest still existed, right? So it might be that there's, you know, it's a fairly good history in the United States of protesters actively getting arrested to make a point but um, should it even come to that? Although I, I think I might distinguish the trespassing case from the immunity if you hit a protester law, because you could at least make the case that the trespassing law was a neutral law that did not True. mean to target speech, while these recent spate of cases are so blatantly designed to target people who are protesting that they would be, I think, fairly predictably struck down by the courts. Although, just piggybacking on your, it couldn't happen here, <laughs> right? Again, this is just in Florida. So Florida wants to kill you if you protest. Um, and then there are another, these are just proposals. These haven't been passed. Right. There was another proposal to sort of strip the courts of judicial review. So I don't know if you've read about this brilliant uh, proposal by someone who clearly did not sit in my con law one class uh, <laughs> who basically wants to give the legislature the power to override a 
Florida court decision declaring a law void. So they, they want to amend the Constitution to say, if the Florida courts declare a law violates the Florida Constitution, the legislature can override that decision and uh, with two thirds vote and sort of uh, reinstate it, which of course sort of misses the point of separation of powers and branches checking each other, never mind their blatant disregard of the federal constitution, which trumps anything Florida might do, but it is being proposed. And, well, and, and along the lines, while, while we're at the it can never happen here, I think, I think it might have been the, uh, the Ten Lulu and Canto case um, where they were, they were dismissed and the president got upset and made public statements uh, not being, uh, voicing his displeasure with the judges and the prosecutors, and then it all got uh, reinstated and the, 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 the students were, were sentenced. Well, it wasn't too terribly long ago, within the last six weeks, where a ruling came out of the Ninth Circuit and um, the current president of the United States said, or I mean it was a district court judging uh, who said uh, that quote so-called judge, unquote, and then said a bad high school student would rule in my favor. It's not too far of a leap between going directly after a judge, voicing displeasure, and forcing a particular judicial outcome from a so-called judge, a, a person who, by the way, has life tenure on the federal bench, and then saying that this person is so stupid that a bad high school student would know how to rule correctly. Um, that's a direct affront to the independence of the judiciary. And if you just you know, read these cases, you think, boy, that can't happen here. I, I, I urge you all, if you think it can't happen here, be very careful, be very diligent, and don't let any of this stuff slide. Although, to sort of switch it back to something a little more optimistic, <laughs> just a little bit more. I'm, I'm I a just, pessimist. No, I'm, I had the same points oh. again. Um, <laughs> the one last thing I do want to point out is that at least a uh, federal circuit was something that you mentioned, is that they are appointed for life. Right. And so one of the critiques you regularly hear against the courts are, who are these people making decisions when they're not democratically elected? You know, isn't that very, uh, well, the word is counter-majoritarian. But in this case, you can see how the fact that they're not directly accountable accountable to the people might actually help um, protect our democracy because they can make decisions based not on pleasing the public or the other branches. They're more likely to make decisions based on principle because they can't be fired or voted out of office. So yay, counter-majoritarian courts. <laughs> well, I like I that word. The discussion brings about different points that are important and demonstrate how there are issues in these two arenas and that the cases demonstrate that even if this is happening in Ecuador with a great concern, it could happen or it has happened in our home too. And that as a matter of sisterhood and brotherhood, we all should be mindful of how these things happen where they happen, because they always happen. And it's a matter of a balance between the three branches of power, between the judiciary, the executive, and the legislator. It's a matter of democracy, because democracy kind of function, as Professor Corbin said, without a free, free, free speech. And free speech needs a strong democracy to function. And that comes within the balance of the three branches. And it comes with the idea of having a strong judicial system, a system that is reliable, truthful, a government that is willing to respect the system, that unlikely, uh, or at least these cases demonstrate that there is a gray area there. So I think it's important to be mindful about it. These cases, this discussion, and Professor Born, Bjorn demonstrate exactly what these cases are about, how it is very common in our era of this happening, and if we are not mindful, it will continue happening, and that we cannot give our rights for granted. So I wanna thank all of you for being here, the ones that are present, the ones that were on the web, in Ecuador, in DC, in a different parts of the world, watching this discussion. I hope you learned a little bit 
a little bit of everything that was discussed, that you're going to be mindful nowadays, that your rights cannot be for granted, that we all have to applaud and speak whenever, whenever it's needed, and that we need to make our institutions accountable for the actions taken. In light of that, I would like to give uh, Mr. Stephen Harper the word. He is part of the project, and he want to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, just first of all, thank you very much for inviting me here to this very important, very thought-provoking panel. Um, my name is Steve Harper. Uh, I'm the treasurer of the Inter-American Bar Association, uh, which is partnered with the IID in putting this together. Um, the Inter-American Bar Association, or the Federación Interamericana de Abogados, called in Spanish, uh, it was founded back in May of 1940. Uh, originally had 44 members located in 17 countries from just around the Western Hemisphere. Today, we have over 600 members from literally around the world. Um, the purpose uh, of the IABA is to serve as a permanent forum for discussing uh, important matters of law uh, and, and um, emphasizing the rule of law and, and to meet to discuss uh, matters such as uh, a, thank you, a, a lack of an independent judiciary that results in human rights violations. That's the very, the very tenet behind which the IABA was founded. Um, I, I urge you all to look into the Inter-American Bar Association. We have annual conferences that meet every year in a different country. Uh, our most recent one was here in Miami. It was supposed to be in Cuba, uh, but was canceled at literally the 11th hour by the Cuban government, uh, reason being that one of our keynote speakers was a secretary general of the OAS, who is very um, notorious for speaking out against the tyranny uh, of the Castro regime, and so when when the Castros found out about that, they said, "Well, we'll pull your plug. I'm so sorry you can't come." Uh, we had it here in Miami; it was a great success, anyways. Despite that, our next annual conference is coming up in June in Panama City. Uh, you are all cordially invited. Uh, if if you'd like to learn more, our our website is uh, iaba.org. I urge you all to learn more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. Watch first. <laughs> <laughs> Are we? Well, Thank you.